We talked about pH last time, and we were getting ready for discussions of liquid-liquid extraction using organic and aqueous phases. So we're going to cover that today, but we're also talking about all kinds of partitioning techniques. So this partitioning is just sort of separating analytes from other analytes or separa separating analytes from the matrices. Um, this takes into account also chromatography. So I've got a couple of uh, new things uh, in this set of notes uh, related to chromatography that we did at the workshop a couple of years ago. So I teach a cleaning workshop, and a lot of times when they discover soils and so on on their parts, they need to figure out what that is. And so they remove it, they try to identify it, and so a lot of times they are forced to use partitioning techniques. So this is the general partitioning uh, idea, and that is you've, you've got an analyte that's either in a matrix, a uh, solid phase or liquid phase, and you need to um, homogenize that and you need to extract it in some way. Uh, there's also digestion. Uh, it's easy to think of like tissue samples needing to be disrupted, but also there's um, soil samples, you know, there's uh, glass samples and so on. So you may need to dissolve all of the components in soils except the silicates, which really don't dissolve in anything, but you can extract those metals out of a soil, centrifuge it down, analyze the supernatant, and that's what they do at tries for a lot of uh, TDC land. You know, if there's been contamination or whatever, they'll do soil samples and they'll look at um, heavy metal contamination in their soil samples and in their water samples. Uh, a lot of that uses acid digestion. So they they make this this acid. I mean, you guys have dealt with hydrochloric acid, with uh, sulfuric acid, nitric acid in labs. Which one of those is the worst that you've experienced? Nitric is probably the most, the one that you were most panicked about. I mean, yeah, if you get nitric on your skin, it like, it'll attack the skin and oxidize and turn it brown. If you ever had brown fingers, you pick up a beaker and you're like, oh crud, you got a brown stripe or like a yellow stripe on your hand. Uh, so nitric acid is pretty bad. Um, there's uh, an, an acid that's even worse. It's called aqua regia, where you take nitric acid and mix it with hydrochloric acid. And it makes this fuming red, acid that will dissolve even more than nitric acid will dissolve. Yeah, so they, that's what you would need if you're really going to digest a, a, a sample, like a glass sample or something like that, it would, it would tear it apart. Um, there's also chromic acid, which is bad because of the chromium. Chromium, it's a toxic metal that you can't release into the environment. So that's, that's a pain to use, but it's a really strong acid. And so you might have to use that in some cases, but in that case, you cannot put that down the drain because of the chromium. You don't want to release the hex hexavalent chromium. So there's, uh, again, acid digestion is a big deal. Uh, you'll put these hard samples in acid and then warm it up. So now you have hot acid and then you really warm it up. Sometimes they do microwave digestion. So they'll put the digestion fluid in a Teflon container and stick it in this industrial microwave and microwave the heck out of it. Yeah. And so what y'all do? Where? Oh, where do y'all do that? Uh, I work at a food testing lab and work on some oh, what, I do. Yeah. What kind of things do y'all uh, digest? Uh, foods, uh, groundwater, soil samples. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So do y'all, what kind of acids do y'all work with? Acaregia. Yeah. Acaregia. It's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, uh, so that's a way to get that analyte away from the matrix. Um, there's also uh, gas liquid partitioning. So if you have a volatile substance, if you can warm that up and sample the headspace, you've taken the gaseous substance that may be fairly dilute in the solution and get it into the gas phase where then you can sample it. Now, this is a, a less useful technique, but it still is used. This would be direct gas injection. So you could take a, a gas tight syringe and basically sniff the container and put that directly into a GC. Uh, but you're injecting so much volume of air that sometimes your peaks are really broad. Uh, a better technique now, and they use this out at the, um, the uh, forensic science facility, uh, is uh, these little um, solid phase absorption fibers. And so it's a solid phase micro extraction. It's a little polymer that uh, is like a silicon pol polymer that you can heat up and drive off all of the compounds from the silicon polymer. And then you pull it back into this little tube and it looks like a syringe. So you can inject it onto a, a GC through the regular port, but it's not a syringe. It's a little polymer fiber. And so you can stick that polymer fiber through this uh, container lid. <clears throat> Where's my pen? 
And so if this is a, if this down here is a tube and you push the plunger down and it sticks this little fiber out into that headspace and then all the molecules stick to that fiber. <clears throat> and so it's just collecting the headspace. It's extracting those molecules from the headspace. Some of them you can put directly in the solution too. And so it doesn't absorb water. It'll absorb the organic compounds and they stick to that fiber. And then you can go put them in the GC. And when you stick that metal tube through the septum in the GC, then you push the plunger down. You're not injecting anything. You're just exposing the fiber into that hot area and the heat drives off all those compounds. So that would be solid phase micro extraction. That's another possibility. So. Oh yeah, where? Yeah. <coughs> so that's um that's probably a, a preferred way to sample headspace than gas uh, direct gas uh, syringe injection into the GC. But, but I've done both. I think the direct injection of gas is more quantifiable uh, because you're sampling the, a certain volume of that headspace. Whereas the micro extraction, it, there's a certain sticking fraction that's different for every molecule. So it's really hard to quantify. It's great for qualitative analysis. You can certainly <laughs> identify what compounds are there. So when we did direct injection of gas, like straight out of the tap, uh, we saw methane, huge peak of methane, and maybe a tiny little peak of ethane. When we put a solid phase micro extraction fiber into a sample of natural gas and injected that under the GC, Methane's not a very sticky molecule. So even though it was the by far the biggest component of natural gas, we got a tiny little peak. And then we got ethane, propane, butane, isobutane, and then the smelly compounds too, the, the, the uh, methane thiol and all of the things that they added to it. So we got all of the additives in natural gas, and we never saw that with the direct injection of the gas. So you get different signals, but we were able to detect all of those other signals um, using solid phase micro extraction. Uh, this gas partitioning can use Routes law to study the main component like the, the solvent. It can also use this, use Henry's law using this Henry's law constant and, and it's valid for very dilute solutions. So this is the dilute analyte in a large matrix and you want to know this Henry's law constant for the analyte and it's much greater than the vapor pressure of that analyte. So um, if you want to know more about this, um, take uh, 4449, okay, thermal, because we talk about it in there. Okay, so then uh, there's also partition in between water and, uh, and organic phases. Uh, this is the classic water, water octanol partition coefficient, where you have this, uh, <clears throat> this ratio, the amount of analyte in the octanol phase divided by the amount of analyte or concentration in the water phase. And so you can put your analyte in here with water and octanol, give it a shake, and then you measure the concentration of your analyte in both phases. Now it's not, to, this little picture is not quite accurate. You're not gonna just dump the SEP funnel into your GC, but you could you know, <laughs> put it in the vials and run your calibrations and everything and, and analyze the concentrations, either GC or LC. Uh, you could probably do this spectroscopically too if you had peaks associated with each of those and you had calibration curves um, in, in, uh, in any spectroscopic technique. But this idea of using an organic phase and, a, and an aqueous phase to separate analytes is what we're going to talk about next, um, this liquid-liquid extraction. So here's a, a nice example. We'll propose a liquid-liquid extraction scheme to separate uh, a sample containing the proxen sodium and codeine HCO. Oh, I forgot to bring the Merck index down today. Um, first the thing you do is always get more information. So how could we separate these two substances? We've got to know something about them. We need to know their structures. We need to know their pKa's, maybe what they're soluble in and so on. Uh, because we want to not just, you know, use water octanol, maybe there's a better organic phase that we could use. So choosing the organic phase is important, and then choosing the pH is important. So you have two choices. What organic phase are you going to use, and what pH are you going to use on the aqueous? So here's the naproxen sodium, and, and there's a clue in the name. 
So when it says, when it has this sodium here, what is that telling you about this particular substance? It's taken the naproxen molecule and somehow paired it with sodium. So they're not talking about sodium, you know, solid sodium metal, okay? They're talking about sodium ions. And so what kind of substance would care anything about an, a positive cation? An anion. And so acids make anions. And so this is telling you that this naproxen is an acid. So when you see something sodium, that tells you that okay. That tells you that the naproxen is an acid. Okay. And whenever you have a, a, a substance that's listed with HCl on there, they're not using hydrochloric acid like it's not codeine dissolved in hydrochloric acid, <laughs> okay? What is that telling you? <clears throat> it's saying that the codeine has been protonated, okay? The codeine has been protonated, and it's attracted now to an anion. So I have the codeine H and the chloride minus. So it's telling you that the codeine is a base. And that base has been protonated and then precipitated with chloride. And we'll get more practice on that. In fact, the, the little drug flashcards that are coming up either in this week's folder or next week's folder, if you look at those and print them off, that's one of the main things I want you to learn from looking at all the drugs. I don't expect you to be able to draw the substance. Like if I say draw cocaine, I don't expect you to be able to draw it. The, the structures are too complex. I could force you to do that, but I think there's... There's too much other material in the course to learn. We'd spend all our time drilling on drawing structures. Uh, but I do expect you to recognize like, this kind of molecule is a cocaine-related molecule because there's a certain structure there, the tropane ring, that you see. You're like, okay, I know that's a, that is a, a cocaine derivative, a cocaine metabolite, or cocaine itself, or, or opiates. They're very easy to recognize. And so I want you to be able to see that structure, the four-ring or five ring structure for opiate and say, okay, those are opiates or opiate related substances. And then I need you to be able to look at those structures and say, okay, that's going to be an organic base or that's going to be an organic acid. So it's because this liquid liquid extraction really depends strongly on whether it's an acid or a base. So those are the kinds of things I want you to know from those drug flashcards. And so that's, uh, that's, that's on the, on the website. And so the, um, whether it's a base or an acid, you can learn sometimes from the names, like you have in this problem here. Um, definitely see it in the structure. So you see this carboxylic acid group, so you know that this is the, the protonated form of the naproxen. Okay. And then down here is codeine, HCl. And so here's the, here's the codeine molecule. Here's the organic base, HCl. See, it's been protonated. And then it was precipitated out of organic solution uh, with that chloride. <clears throat> so it made a, a salt, and a salt is not going to be soluble in an organic solution. So it was salted out of an organic solution and purified, and then packaged and sold as, as, as coating HCl. So that's the base. Here's the table for, of information from the Merck Index. The Merck Index is a pharmaceutical reference. Merck is a pharmaceutical company. And it has all kinds of drugs and substances, uh, pharmaceutical substances in it. And you, it's about that thick. So it's enormous. Um, definitely, I mean, if you buy a new one, you better get your checkbook out, right? But if you, um, you don't use checkbooks anymore. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Cash out. No, um, so, uh, but, but if you go online and look for a used copy, it's going to be fine. I mean, all the substances with the, with the exception of maybe the fentanyl analogs are, are pretty old. And so they're all going to be in there. And the fentanyl analogs are probably old enough to be in, in there in, in many cases. So what do we have here? Um, <clears throat> we got the PKA. So this is the PKA for the naproxen molecule, the acid. This is the PKA of the protonated base. Remember, PKAs are for the acid species. So anytime you see a PKA, if it's a base, it's the protonated base that is giving you the PKA. <clears throat> it also has some solubility information here. So naproxen sodium is insoluble. Um, 
well, actually, the acid is insoluble. If you if you uh, ionize it and put it with sodium, it is soluble. But and then you have this log p, which is that that partition function, the octanol water partition function. It's the log of that number, and so this tells you it's it's much more interested in in a um, the octanol layer than it is the water layer. Um, this is the solubility in ethanol. So one essentially. Uh, it's by mass. Um, you could say one gram to 25 grams of ethanol, one gram to 15 grams of chloroform, one gram to 40 grams of ether. Whereas down here, uh, this is much less soluble in chloroform. So one gram to 800 grams. So this is a really good difference. And so this is going to be very, you know, low solubility, no high solubility in chloroform. This is a low solubility in chloroform. And so that's the biggest difference we can exploit, exploit that. So I'm going to use chloroform for my organic layer. And so then let's think about what we have in terms of pH. So at low pH, we found that the, um, the uh, let's see, let me go back to the table, just make sure. Yeah, so the, P, the pKa of naproxen sodium is 4.2. So if we're below 4.2, both of these are protonated. If we're below 8.2, this one's protonated. If we're above 8.2, this is deprotonated. If we're above 4.2, this one's deprotonated. So we can look at that and see where we can separate these two. So below 4.2, then we have both of them protonated. If we go above 8.2, both of them are deprotonated. And the way I, I try to find the situation where one is protonated and the other isn't is by using this kind of speciation chart. Okay, so um, one way to do this, let's just do a, a C and an N. So up here we have C and N. So this is the naproxen sodium. And, and below 4.2, which is right here, we have NH. And above 4.2, it's deprotonated. So we have N minus. They all understand my terminology, naproxen anion or naproxen protonated neutral acid. So this one is neutral. This one is ionized. And so this is water soluble. This whole region is water soluble. If the water layer has a pH above 4.2. Then up here, codeine, this is a base. This is why you have to know whether it's a base or, or, a, or an acid, because this is CH plus, and this is just neutral C. See, it's not just whether it's low pH or high pH. It has to, you have to know if it's a base or an acid. So at, at acidic pHs, anything below 8.2, that base is protonated, okay? And anything above 8.2, that base is deprotonated and it's, it's organics. So this would be organic layer. This is water layer. So this is ionized. So do y'all see now what we were talking about percent ionization and all of that last time? It's like trying to figure out where we are in terms of bases and acids, acids compared to pH. And so this is the pH of the aqueous layer. So this is pH. So if I were right here at 5.5, I'd have both of them in the aqueous layer. Okay. And then if anything was in that, let's say I had a, a really dirty sample and I had a whole bunch of other organic compounds, I would pull these two into the aqueous layer. Maybe the other organics stay in the organic layer and I could throw that organic layer away and I've cleaned up my, my substances. Then I put in a fresh organic layer. They're still in the aqueous layer. And then I change the pH. It doesn't matter really in this situation which direction I go. If I go down to pH of 2, 
then the naproxen is protonated and neutral and it jumps into the organic layer. So I've separated them both. And then if I were to jump up or, or if I were to jump up to a pH of say 11, maybe I put some sodium hydroxide in my aqueous layer and the pH of the aqueous phase jumps high, then I deprotonate that base and it goes into the organic layer. So I can control which one of these goes into the organic layer and stays in the aqueous layer. So that's what we do with liquid-liquid extraction. Um, you can separate all kinds of compounds this way. And so there's some practice on the homework. So this chart in the middle, I would definitely encourage you when you're doing the homework, I think there's three substances on the homework, is put three regions in there and do the speciation. Where am I, which one is ionized, which one's not, and what pH does it go? So you draw vertical lines on each of those panels where the pKa's are. And the pKa is of the acid piece at low pH, it's protonated. At high pH, it's deprotonated. Listen to my words carefully. I say protonated and deprotonated. Now, whether it's an acid or base, that tells you whether it's ionized or not. So both of these are protonated at low pH. So that you can always rely on. Low pH, things are protonated. You've got acid protons everywhere. you got to know if it's a base, whether that's an ionized substance or not. If it's an acid, it's neutral. If it's, an I if it's a base, it's ionized and it's got a positive charge. So it'll go into the aqueous. So you can't always say at low pH things go into the aqueous layer because organic acids don't. Yeah, yeah, organic acids go into the, the or, organic phase at low pH. So I'm going to make sure I don't get that backwards or I'll screw you up. Okay. So for example, you know, you could avoid ranges between 4.2 and 8.2 if you wanted to split these into the two layers. Um, there may be a situation where you want to clean them up, so you'd stay in the middle, keep them in the uh, aqueous phase, and then flush all the other organics out with the organic phase, and then refresh that organic phase. So this is um, just showing you the, the partitions, this chloroform water partition coefficient. And so we know the chloroform concentration, roughly 1 to 15 for uh, for the naproxen and it was insoluble in water as the acid form and so essentially you're going to get an infinite partition uh, in the chloroform and then if it was in the um, the codeine situation you would have a low concentration in the chloroform a higher concentration in the water and so compare that to infinity you got a really good separation so you put all this in the separate separatory funnel pick a ph so let's say of um of uh, of two, so you protonate that acid, it goes into the organic phase, and then you can separate them really well. Now, this is sort of a universal extraction scheme. You could start with acid. So you have an, um, uh, an organic solvent. A lot of times they use ethyl acetate. Uh, chloroform is really good, but it's chlorinated, and you may not want to work with the chlorinated solvent uh, health-wise. But um, again, if you're working in a hood, you're, you're well protected. Um, so you have an organic phase in contact with the aqueous phase. You adjust the, the pH of the aqueous phase to two or less with, say, hydrochloric acid. And then the aqueous phase contains your bases and water solubles. And your organic phase contains your acids and your neutrals. And so if you split these apart into two different, um, uh, two different set funnels, the aqueous phase comes over here and the organic phase comes over here, okay? So do y'all see what this universal scheme is? Each, each thing splits the organic and the aqueous phase. So then over here, we get a new organic phase, and we adjust the aqueous phase to pH nine. So we, you know, we find whatever uh, acid, weak acid we wanna use, or, or base we add it until we get to a pH of nine. And now that gets the weak basis in the organic phase, and then the, uh, the uh, and, and pulls out those weak bases. So that goes here. Then this aqueous phase is here. And we refresh the organic. And then the organic phase would have, uh, if we adjust this to a pH of 11, okay, we deprotonate the, those um, strong bases and uh, they go into the organic phase. And then the things that just 
our aqueous soluble like metals and water solubles they stayed in the water layer the whole time and so that would that would be a way to separate all of your different weak bases and strong bases then over here we're separating the acids and so then we refresh this with the new aqueous so new aqueous layer adjust the ph6 and so the weak acids and neutral organic molecules are gonna stay in the organic phase. Uh, the aqueous phase here has strong acids. And, and for some reason they put out salicylic acid as called it out specifically. Then this organic phase comes down here and we get a new aqueous. And we adjust that pH to greater than 10 and so then we split the organic neutrals and we have weak acids because um, we've deprotonate them, deprotonated them at that strong base. So we pull those weak acids out into the aqueous layer. And, uh, and this is a great way, a scheme with five separations to separate a ton of analytes. And then you can take those different separations and run them in your chromatography um, setup. So let's talk about chromatography. We have different kinds of chromatography. You have gas chromatography where the molecules are essentially separated by their boiling points, uh, but some things have such high boiling points that they're really difficult to separate. So we use liquid chromatography. And there's a bunch of different types. Let me focus a little bit on uh, partition chromatography. Let's see. And, then, and mainly wanting to focus on this vocabulary, this crazy vocabulary. So the original, you know, Liquid chromatography used a polar stationary phase, namely aluminum oxide. Oops. So it can be made in high purity. It's a white powder. You can put it in a column and you can pour your analytes in the top and then just start eluting it with, uh, with an organic phase, an elution mixture. And you can also change the nature of that solvent, that mobile phase, and you can deposit compounds on the polar column pull things off that are nonpolar or less polar, and then you start changing the polarity of your solvent. And that's called solvent programming. You can do it by hand if in like prep columns if you're separating a large amount of analyte, but on the liquid chromatographs, the automated ones, they, you might have four solvents up there and these little four solenoids that are like pumping two pumps of this solvent and one pump of that solvent to get a two to one ratio. And so this is all programmable now. You just put it into the into the program. Now that's uh, for a stationary phase. That's the the old school way to do it. That's why they call it normal phase. It's kind of strange that they just call that normal, but that's what it was. And so then when you hear about reverse phase, that means it's a nonpolar stationary phase. And so they're probably using something like one of those organic um, columns, maybe a a silicon oxide backbone with. Of phenyl groups on it or something that's got a lot of electron density that's going to be real flexible like a like a aromatic ring and it's going to really interact with nonpolar substances and so this stationary phase would stick the nonpolar things and the polar things would wash through so you need to know if you want to know what comes out first you need to know what phase you have normal phase or stationary uh, or reverse phase so if you have a normal phase column the polar things stay put and the nonpolar things come out first. And if you reverse that, it's reversed. If you use a reverse phase column, then the polar substances come out first and the nonpolar substances come out later. You can separate ions using ion exchange liquid chromatography. And then polymers, there's a couple of different ways to do that, but uh, size exclusion or gel permeation chromatography. So these are uh, porous columns and the, and the polymers get trapped in those pores and elute slower. So the big polymers go right through, the little polymers get stuck. So that would be size exclusion. And then there's a change in the mobile phase. Uh, sometimes there's advantages uh, to using different mobile phases and supercritical fluid chromatography is really one of the more interesting mobile phases. So that would be supercritical CO2. So CO2 at, at high pressures um, can behave like a liquid. So you can liquefy it, you get it up high enough, it's actually super critical, it's above its critical points. Critical points are critical pressure, temperature, and volume. 
and uh, if you get it above the critical pressure and above the critical temperature, if supercritical fluid region, and uh, they use that. CO2 is, uh, you can get CO2 to be a supercritical fluid without too dangerous a pressure system. So it's achievable. But you can do that with just about anything, but uh, the pressures involved may be too high. Um, so. Let's talk now about uh, chromatography just as a visual example. And so this is a thin layer chromatography. How many people have used this in your chemistry experience? Anybody? Is this in any of your organic labs? No? You did? Okay. Where, what, what lab was it? Do you remember? And, uh, Dr. Gross's research lab. Okay, Dr. Gross's research lab. Yeah, so when, tell us about it. What did y'all uh, use it for? Um, for like uh, characterization whenever we like, synthesize uh, molecules. Um, since um, like, it basically like, tells you the polarity of, um, of whatever is uh, in the solution. Mm -hmm. um, so then we'd like compare like the starting material versus like what we think is the product. And then yeah. like, if we see like a big difference, then we can tell if there's an interaction. Yeah, so it's a great way to do that, to test very quickly whether there was actually a reaction. Or not. You can take the starting material, put a little dot on here, Let's say that, you know, we, we put a starting material dot here. We have an eluent, which is the mobile phase. This is the alumina or Al2O3, aluminum oxide on glass. That's the stationary phase, it's very polar. And then as that mobile phase moves up, it drags the compounds along. And so they have that partition between being in the mobile phase or being in the stationary phase. And so they go into the mobile phase for a while. They're interacting with the stationary phase. If they're very polar, they like the stationary phase. So it's really an example of that idea of like dissolves like. So if your mobile phase is like your molecule, it's going to go into the mobile phase and travel fast. And if your mobile, if your molecule is like the stationary phase, it's going to stay and very spend very little time in the mobile phase. Just statistically, it might dissolve for a little bit. But then as it's bouncing around, it gets back on the aluminum oxide and it likes that polar environment, so it, it sticks. So if you run this and you get three spots and you only had, say, two reactants, <laughs> you got a third spot. You see, hey, something, is, something has, uh, has reacted. Um, or if you have a, a substance that's got a lot of different analytes in it, you can put a dot on here and you can see how many analytes that you get and they pop out. So this is... Uh, uh, used for some drug tests, um, you can actually separate some of the cannabinoids and then you spray a little developer on there and they'll change color. How did you analyze your spots? Did you, were they visible with the eye or did you? Um, we put them under UV light. Yeah, so UV light sometimes, they fluoresce um, or the lumina fluoresces and they don't, so you see a dark spot. Um, so what you'll do sometimes if you see a, a under fluorescent, you see a spot right here that you can't see with your eye. When you have the UV light on, uh, I would say put on gloves so you're not hitting your hands with strong UV light, and then get a pencil and mark around where that compound is. Okay. Now you can, this is sort of telling you that there are differences in substances, you can scrape this off and this off and that off with a spatula. And so sometimes people will scrape those spots off with a spatula, put them in a tiny little vial, and then put a solvent in there and dissolve that substance up in a solvent and then run a GC on it or run an LC. Um, so you might even be able to characterize it or even extract it to the solvent and then um, dry it in a sample injector and go straight to mass spec. And so you can get a mass spec of it. You've already done the separation where I run it through another column. You're just going to spread your molecules out and dilute the signal. So sometimes you have direct injection mass spec, so you can, you can take that spot, dissolve it in the smallest amount of solvent possible, put it on a little, these little direct injection spoons, let the solvent evaporate, and then you put it into the mass spec, and it warms it up and injects it right onto the mass spec. And that's a great way to characterize it. Now this is a prep column, or column chromatography, or prep chromatography over here. And this would be for large amounts of substances. So you put, the mixture up here and then <laughs> you can do it by hand where you just keep pouring solvent in the top and this is nice especially if you're using alumina because you got this nice white column and you can see the colors come down 
and you have a detector, you can you can collect these fractions and different beakers and so on. Has anybody ever done prep column chromatography? In Baokin lab, okay. Do you get any colors out of it? It's nice, yeah. So it's a it's I think it's very pleasing. This is one of the first things that got me interested in chemistry. Okay, so my uh, see, was it seventh grade? It might have been. It's my science teacher. She had a plant that had green and red leaves, and so she took the leaves and she ground them up in a mortar and pestle because everybody sees a mortar and pestle and thinks, ah, oh, science, right? So she grinds these leaves up and then she squirts some ethanol in there and ground it up and then she put it on one of these columns and then started pouring the, the ethanol through. And uh, I didn't even think as a kid that, you know, my teacher's got like 100% ethanol in class. But <laughs> she, she's pouring it into the top and it's, it's flowing down and we can see the green layer and we can see the red layer and then we can see them separate as we went. And so then she caught them in a beaker. So it was really cool. So I was I was super impressed with that. So um, anyway, that's good. And you can you can separate quite a you know large amount of sample with column chromatography as compared to, to TLC. Now this is a video from the um, remote workshop. So I teach cleaning and uh, in industrial cleaning. And a lot of times you have this problem soil, it would be really nice to characterize it. And so we uh, do a hands-on workshop. We were doing them every other year. So we did one in 2018. And then in 2020, we were coming up to do another one. We had advertised for a year and built it all up and everything and starting to take people's money and they had sponsorships and everything. And then COVID hit. And so, uh, we spent the next year, the COVID year, doing webinars to try to keep people still interested in the workshop. And then as 2021 was coming along, we thought, you know, people are still not ready to travel. Let's try to make this thing virtual. So uh, had a couple of students that were really talented <clears throat> with um, um, <clears throat> working with the um, OB, OBS. I don't know if you know about OBS, but they were they made some great scenes. And so this is our setup. This is Barbara and Ed Koenigsberg, my colleagues in California. So they're on Zoom with me in California. We have uh, a camera on me with a green screen behind me, and we have a camera on the apparatus that's being substituted in for the green screen. And so we had five cameras, I think, working this whole workshop. And so this is the, the video on the thin layer chromatography and we use Sharpie as an example because it's got uh, carbon black, which is like soot. So if you're in an industrial facility and you, your part or your tools get too hot, they carbonize things. And so you have soot on your tools. Um, the uh, Sharpie also has pigments, so a lot of organic molecules in it. And then it has a polymer binder that sticks it. That's why it doesn't wash off very easily. So it's like the worst case scenario for uh, soil on your part. You've got a polymer binder holding soot on, and it's got a lot of this coloration that's going to leach out. So this is... Um, I'll get to it. <clears throat> Let's see, I don't have the sound. Anyway, I'll, I'll do the voiceover. So we have the industrial Sharpie and regular Sharpie marked on a thin layer chromatography um, slide. We've got an elution chamber with ethanol in the bottom, which ethanol is not a great solvent for Sharpie. It, it's, it's a moderately good solvent. And so it's, gonna, it's not gonna dissolve the whole line and move it. It's gonna dissolve some of the compounds in that line and move those compounds. And so we set that aside and we went on and did other things in the workshop. And, and so uh, the eluent, the solvent will soak up that aluminum oxide you just got to make sure your line is above the layer of the liquid so that the liquid has to move up through the aluminum oxide, the stationary phase. And so here it's moved a little bit. You can definitely see right away that industrial Sharpie and regular Sharpie are different. So in a forensic application, you might be done, right? If you were asked to see, oh, back up. Let's see if it was right about here. No, it was right here. So for comparison's sake, you know, a lot of times you're just trying to exclude, right? You don't need to characterize everything. So in a forensic situation, are these two pins the same? Right now, you know they're not, okay? Because you just run a thin layer chromatography, you get different signals, you know they're not the same.
Um, but in, in a science situation, you may want to know more about them. So, oops, these little video inserts in the PowerPoint are kind of a pain. So let's go back over here. I pulled them out and I'll talk about them. So you can see that it's kind of a smear. We don't get great separation, but we have uh, this, this solvent front. As soon as you pull them out, you've got to mark the solvent front because the migration percentage is repeatable. So if it goes 75% of the solvent front, it will do that every time, that particular compound. That's like the percentage it wants to be in the mobile phase. So it wants to be in the mobile phase 75% of the time. So it's going to go 75% up. The solvent goes all the way. It's 100%. If something's completely soluble in the solvent, it will go all the way to the top. If it's 75% compared to the stationary phase, it'll go 75% up. 30% further down and so on. You can actually take these, um, these and you can think about this as, as a chromatogram. So like this, if we were to draw a line, like the total chromatogram might look like that. So if we put this in a, in a chromatograph, GC, LC, whatever, then we might be able to get that signal. But this is a nice visual, you know, this is a nice visual um, example of what we're seeing in a chromatogram, right? So there's a substance here, that's that peak. There's a substance there, that's that peak. A little substance there, that's that peak. And so the peaks in the chromatogram, you can actually see on this thin layer chromatography plate. And now how this one's really smeared out, well, then that's going to give you a really wide peak in the chromatogram. So I like this because it's such a visual technique. It's not as good at separating as a, as a capillary gas chromatograph. That, that, that column, see, this is maybe uh, three inches long. And the, the uh, column in a GC, these capillary columns, 30 meters. <laughs> so the molecules are going through 30 meters of tubing, and that, that's where you get really good separation. And then you might have a detector that's selective. So let's say we had a detector that had a filter on it, and it only saw blue compounds. And so then notice how it simplifies the chromatogram. So up here at the, at the top, you have this, you know, it's just sort of an example of selective chromatogram. We see this blue peak here and this blue peak here and then something maybe in that one. And so it ignores the yellow. And so that's what we would have for um, a selective chromatogram. It doesn't have to be mass spec. You could do that with IR. If you have a GC, FTIR, you could look at a particular, say, carbonyl. And it's only going to see when the carbonyl substance is coming up. Okay. Or if you have a mass spec, you can have the total ion chromatogram, all the ions that come off of the column or you could have a selective ion. So if you're looking for a particular substance, say codeine, then you would look for that molecular ion. And as soon as the codeine came out, then you would see it. Now you might get, um, trying to think of the structure of codeine, we just saw it, but, but it might also be a fragment of say heroin. So you might get two peaks and you would do your analysis and see, okay, this is the heroin peak, this is the codeine peak. But it would definitely simplify the chromatogram. And so then this is what the instruments look like. These are some real fancy ones, actually. We have the gas chromatograph. This has some extra detectors on it, um, probably a mass spec. This is the iron chromatograph. And then here's the liquid chromatography. Both of these are liquid chromatography, but iron chromatography is a subset of liquid chromatography. Then you have enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assays, which after COVID, everybody knows about, <laughs> okay? How many people took a home at-home COVID test? Any? Yeah. How many got one that popped positive? <laughs> yeah. So the first three or four that I did never came back positive. I just had colds, you know, and I'm, I'm doing the swabs and making myself sneeze and went through all of that and never got a line. And then, uh, gosh, it was, it was in the fall. Was it summer? I'm trying to remember when it was. I think it was the summertime. Anyway, Jennifer and I were feeling pretty bad, so I went and got the kits, and we we did the thing, and it was like, bing, you're supposed to wait. What is it, 15 minutes? Yeah, I mean, 
as soon as the line went across, it was red. I was like, oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah. And then uh, in July, my father passed away in Fort Worth. So we were trying to set the funeral and everything. And uh, my mom wasn't feeling good. She had a bad cough. And I was like, you know, we're bringing all these people in for the funeral. Let's check. And so sure enough, boom, she was positive COVID. And I was like, no way. So we had to, to postpone the, the visitation and everything for a few days. So, but anyway, how does this work? Well, you have this, um, and it's, it's, there's like 500 different ways to make these, but, but you have uh, an antigen antibody complex. And most of these are, are done by uh, competition. So you have this little enzyme, you have the, the drug and the antibody that reacts to that drug, or in the case of COVID, you have some sort of spike protein or something that that antibody is going to react to or bind to. And then you have this, uh, this enzyme that's gonna create the color change. Now, the most important thing is, is what's going on with this control line? Y'all understand why that's important? Yeah, and so what might make it faulty? What might make your test faulty? Yeah, so there's lots of places it could go wrong. And one of the biggest is temperature excursions. So think about denaturing your proteins. These enzymes and everything are protein based. And so if uh, the Binax now or whatever kit had been in the back of a shipping vehicle that got stranded, whatever, in the West Texas, and the interior of that truck got up to whatever, 150 degrees, you know, it might denature some of those proteins and ruin the test. So you have that control line, and that's really important. If you don't have the control line, then you might get a false positive or a false negative. It's just an invalid test. But if you see the control line and it's a nice, dark, bright line, you say, okay, then, then at least the test is, is functioning now we looked and read the result to see if the result is working. Now, all of this has been automated. These were the at-home type things. And it's now been automated where you can put in, you can actually buy these plates that have already got the antibodies and enzymes and everything in the wells for particular analytes. And so this is how all of the urine testing for drugs and hormones and anabolic steroids and things like that in, in testing labs will bring in all kinds of samples, urine samples, blood samples, and so on. And they'll, they'll load up these trays with these multiple pipetters. They'll do their dilutions and they'll stick it on a plate reader. And that plate reader is a little robotic thing. It goes in this little tray and it does a, a like a UV vis scan on all of these. And some of these like five, 1536 well plate. There's so many samples are in there. Now, I want you to type pipe at 1500 samples. Okay. <laughs> no. Now these things, once you get up to that point, it's robotic. Yeah. So you have robotic pipetters and they'll come along with all these little hoses and they'll, they'll build, like you set up your standards. It will make the dilution curve, the calibration curve. It will run your samples through. It's all barcoded. It knows what well plates are or what, and it'll run all of that. It'll do check samples. It'll do all of it and puts out your data in a spreadsheet and plots the graphs and everything like that. And then we do have one of these plate readers here. Does y'all do it in BioCam? Where is that used? Yeah, but it doesn't, I mean, I don't know, what's the biggest number of plate uh, wells? What, 96, yeah. Do y'all have the like um, six wide or whatever pipetters where you can do six at a time or is it just all singles? Yeah, so they make them even like some handheld ones I've seen you look online, just pipetters or multi-pipetters, you'll see that are some are really wide, and so you can do, you know, um, serial dilutions, I guess, very easily. All right. So this this really isn't. I wouldn't say this is necessarily a, a separations technique, but it is partitioning. It's sensitive to a particular analyte. So that's what we would really call selectivity rather than partitioning. And so this is this is the word here. It's very selective. Meaning, meaning that it can find the spike protein in the midst of a whole bunch of other things, right? Like think about what's in your nose. I mean, we well, probably don't want to, but you know, you, you rub that Q-tip in your nose and you have tons of proteins in, in that Q-tip. And this is able to be selective and find that one, you know, billion, I would say one billion, which is a really small number, a billion 
spike proteins and, and give you a, a recognizable sig signal. So that's, that's very selective. It had to sort through the haystack of all the other proteins in your nose and find the spike protein from COVID if it was there. Now, if it's a tiny amount of COVID, like you just walk past somebody that sneezed and you got like two or three spike proteins in your nose, it's not going to detect that. It's really going to detect people who are shedding virus. So this whole um, asymptomatic, um, you know, carriers and so on, they, I think they, they kind of harmed science in my opinion by making it sound like if you just like bumped into somebody that had COVID, now you're, you're totally able to, to carry that to someone else. That's not impossible, but it's incredibly unlikely because the, the real contagious people are the ones that are actively multiplying the virus in their body and they're shedding billions upon billions upon billions of COVID uh, viruses. So it's just coming out of you and it's spraying out of you. So that's why it's so, contagious when you have somebody that's actively a, a, a COVID factory, but someone who like picks something up that's been sneezed on, it's on their hands and they uh, go to the bathroom and they push the little button for the towel and then now it's on the, on the button and somebody else does the same and they would have to, they would have to be the wet the whole time and they would have to stick it directly in their nose for that to really be transmitted. And that's just not likely. So fomites or, or, or contact surfaces, were really not that contagious. Um, they did some studies where they found maybe there was some possibility of getting infection that way, but but this was a respiratory virus. It was it was droplets, person to person. And uh, there's a study now that of 610,000 uh, uh, people in multiple states worldwide that said the masks really didn't stop it. But I mean, you can look at that and see that it went through. If you're not immune to it, eventually you're going to get it. I mean, it's going to it's going to happen. Uh, sensitive, that means a, a very small number of, uh, of analytes will give you a good signal. So a really steep slope. Concentration is your x-axis. Signal is your y-axis. So that st slope is steep. That's what we would call sensitive. Small change in concentration, huge change in signal. And these are very good because, again, they, they um, you know, as you, as you um, populate those little antibodies, you activate this enzyme and it creates the color change. So you get a really huge signal change. All right, that's all we've got. Next time we're gonna do like a one lecture survey of instrumental analysis.